on to uh, 1979. A labor lawyer by day, Steve Holroyd has been researching and writing about American soccer history ever since the internet gave interested parties a forum. He also possesses a considerable library of soccer magazines, newspapers, and media guides. Steve's love for the game began in 1973 when the arrival of the Philadelphia Adams lured him in. 45 years later, he is still playing, and he has also coached, refereed, and served as an administrator. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I, I don't know if apologize is the word. Up until a couple of days ago, this topic seemed like it would be particularly timely, uh, but in light of the fact that the players in MLS have apparently reached agreement on a, um, a reopening strategy, as well as ratifying the original contract. We won't necessarily have to worry about strikes and lockouts for the near future, but we did have to worry about it in 1979. Now, Tom, we're gonna to go with my signal. How are we gonna do the yes? Uh, yes, that's okay. fine. Yep. I have a lot of slides. Don't laugh, Dave. I'll, I'll cripple you when we do get together and play. Um, uh, I have a lot of slides. It, it, it's meant for everyone to read after the fact. So I'm going to really kind of blow through this to stick within my 10 limit, 10 minute uh, limit. Um, so uh, if we could just move right along. Um, next one. Uh, real fast, believe it or not, athletes, just like most other workers in the United States, do have the right to organize. Baseball's had a union for years, obviously. There's a great history there. American football, uh, basketball, started by future American Soccer League Commissioner Bob Cousy has got a union. Uh, hockey, of course has a union, um, English football has a union. Uh, the, the Jimmy Hill uh, sort of energized it in the late 1950s, uh, broke the maximum wage, and of course went on to be a part owner of the Detroit Express uh, here in the North American Soccer League. Soccer in America, not, not surprisingly, given the fact that the sport was largely semi-pro through most of its history, and probably because of some cultural issues uh, with the largely immigrant participation, no real evidence of any attempt uh, by soccer players to organize earlier, but that's not to mean they were pushovers. For instance, in 1930, a number of players with the New York Giants lodged a complaint with the USFA alleging they hadn't been paid. Uh, it was resolved, but uh, with those troublesome Brown family up there, but, uh, but the, they managed to get paid. So it showed that they weren't pushovers. So, but overarching question many people have why a union we're so focused on individual contracts when we talk about players what's the point of a union well there are a lot of issues common to all players uh pensions uh health benefits free agency eligibility things like that that's best accomplished through an overall contract and laterally um, unions play an important role particularly in franchise leagues not so much sing single entity leagues in allowing salary caps to be in place which would otherwise be illegal as an unlawful restraint of trade under antitrust acts. So let's talk about the first attempt of players to organize in this country, the North American Soccer League Players Association. It began in 1977, which was a great year for the NASL. It was very much in growth mode, um, riding the, the coattails of the, Pele, of the goodwill from Pele's farewell tour. At the same time, many players, particularly the American ones, could see that opportunities for them were decreasing and indeed, uh, their concerns uh, came about in April of 77 when a former coach named John Young said American players are being discriminated against. The owners don't want them playing because they fear a players union. Into the breach stepped another Scotsman, John Kerr, a Scottish born uh, Canadian international, finishing his career with the Washington diplomats. And he began to take steps to form a union similar to the, to the big four. He knew he needed an ally. Unfortunately, he didn't pick the best ally. He picked the closest one. Uh, the only one of the big four who was located in Washington was the NFLPA, and in hindsight, he could have made a worse pick. In the summer of 77, the North American Soccer League Players Association was formed with Ed Garvey named as executive director. Now, coincidentally, Garvey was also the executive director of the NFLPA, and he was authorized to help assist uh, the NASLPA as it got off the ground. A um, little prelude. In order to become a, a recognized union, you have to prove you have support uh, and, uh, under federal, American federal labor law. By July of 1977, approximately 300 players had signed cards authorizing the NASLPA as their bargaining representative, and the union then filed a petition for election with the National Labor Relations Board in August of 77. 
13 days later, Garvey submitted a demand for recognition, trying to bypass the process on, NASL, on NFL PA stationary, which would cause problems. Uh, typically, elections are easy to get. In this case, however, the, the North American Soccer League raised a number of issues. They challenged the legitimacy of the NASL PA, saying basically it was a front for the NFL PA, pointing out, among other things, the demand came on NFL PA letterhead. They also argued, no, I'm sorry, go back. They also argued um, a league-wide election was inappropriate. It should have been team by team, which would have meant, you know, 18 individual collective bargaining agreements. And interestingly, they also argued the union was a competitor employer because it had begun to operate soccer camps. Uh, a hearing on these issues was heard in September of 1977, but it wasn't until June 30 of 78 that the NRB finally issued its decision, essentially siding with the NASL Players Union although it did exclude the two Canadian teams as being outside the jurisdiction. Um, the election was held and the union won uh, rather resoundingly and was certified as the exclusive bargaining representative for players in September of 78. Because of quirks in administrative law, however, the NASL couldn't appeal the board's decision directly. Instead, in order to get the matter into the courts, it would basically have to deliberately break the law and refuse to bargain in order to get what's called a test of certification. And so when the NASLPA made a request to bargain in September 12 of 78, it was ignored by the NASL. Uh, the, by, the union filed charges, the NORB issued a complaint, and uh, filed a motion for summary judgment for February 2nd of 79, where it sat. Um, ordinarily, uh, don't do that, uh, no, no, go back, I'm, there's an itch. Um, ordinarily, you, know, you would just sit and wait. Uh, because the parties, uh, the employer in particular, is required to maintain the status quo as far as working conditions, and we'll talk about that a bit more. However, the NASL was, was trying to get cured. In January of 79, the league requested 246 working visas from the U.S. Department of Labor, one more than in 1978, but it's important to note 476 players used the allotted visas in 78 because you could swap them out. The union challenged the number requested, arguing that the NASL was trying to push American players out of the league, pointing out there were plenty of available American players to replace players who might have left um, a visa. Basically, the union was challenging the revolving door policy the NASL had in place. Um, the DOL essentially sided with the union, reducing the number of visas to 220, and more important, ruled that a visa cannot be reused unless the initial player was injured or quit voluntarily and left the country. It also basically doubled the minimum salary required under visa. So it was a big win for the players, which left them feeling rather emboldened. A little side note, uh, two players, uh, Kevin Keelan with New England, David Robb with Tampa Bay, uh, had filed charges against the union with the NORB, claiming that the union was being discriminated, it was discriminated against foreign players, charges were dismissed. Um, now, while the NASL had already won the right to be recognized. It had already been certified. It was growing impatient with the, uh, with the process. And so it decided to further um, flex its muscle, had, having succeeded before to do well, and decided it would try to force the league to drop its legal appeal and come to the bargaining table. So prior to the uh, 1979 season, uh, the players began to threat the strike. Now, again, as opposed to most strikes, which are designed to provide, put pressure on an employer to provide more money or better benefits, the goal of this strike was to get the players that which they already had, the right to sit down and bargain. Um, the union set a deadline of March 31st for the league to come to the table. Uh, if the league was not at the table, they would, the union would then take a strike vote. League didn't come to the table, and the players voted basically two to one to strike. On Friday, April 13th, the NASLP announced that the players were on strike. And at that moment, the union learned, which many unions both before and since have learned, there's a deep drink of water between talking about a strike and actually going on strike. That weekend, there was a wide disparity in participation. Um, some games utterly unaffected, uh, other games chaos. Uh, here's three quick examples, which I won't read to, except California, which is pictured there. They actually had five regulars picketing outside uh, the uh, stadium in Anaheim. Um, two great examples, though. Fort Lauderdale strikers lived up to their name. 16 players walked out and they were forced to play coach Ron Newman, who's uh, pictured there, uh, along with players picked up off the street and two scabs, George Best and Nene Cabias, in a loss to a Washington team that lost only three players due to the strike. Detroit Express, missing only two players, faced a Memphis team that only had one regular 
playing, and his agent was the goalkeeper. Particularly emblematic of the chaos surrounding the strike was the Cosmos. The Cosmos initially voted 20 to 2 in favor of the strike. Giorgio Canaglia, shockingly, was one of those who was against it. However, 14 regulars changed their minds and went to Atlanta to play. And everyone was watching this. Indeed, press reports indicate that players from around the league were calling in Atlanta and asking, is Beckenbauer striking? And when finding out he wasn't, they didn't as well. Ultimately, only 143 players, less than a third of the league, actually went on the strike, and most of them American. Nevertheless, the union vowed to continue, saying that the participation was less than expected because of um, issues with immigration laws. Immigration laws tend to pop up in American soccer an awful lot, going back all the way to 1894. In 1979, the issue was whether foreign players who decided to cross the line and, and play would be deported as strike breakers, which is prohibited. Conversely, the owners were telling players that if the foreign players, that if they participated in a strike, it could get them deported. So while that issue was up in the air, Garvey was scrambling to save face. On April 16th, the union offered to end the strike and promised not to strike again, even if there was no agreement on a collective bargaining agreement uh, when they got to the table, if the, if the NASL would come to the table. The NASL ignored the offer. On April 17th, Garvey, Kerr, and representatives from several other teams met with the Cosmos players to try to convince them to join the strike, knowing that if the, as the Cosmos went, the rest of the league would go. The Cosmos demurred. Um, that same day, INS killed what little support for the strike was left among the foreign players by announcing that foreign players on a current visa, in other words, not brought in to be strike breakers, would not be deported. At that point, with the strike largely an all-American prospect, uh, the league called the strike off. Now, the denouement of the strike. Uh, with the strike and utter failure, the NASL returned to business as usual and had a successful year at the gate uh, with its highest average uh, over just over 14,000 at that point. Um, two weeks after the strike, the NRB finally issued its decision affirming the election decision and finding that the league had unlawf unlawfully refused to bargain, which is what the league had been waiting for. They filed an appeal to the U.S. Court of uh, Common Pleas. On March 21st of 1980, the Fifth Circuit affirmed the NRB's decision uh, effectively ending the NASL's challenge to the appropriateness of the union in the bargaining unit, and the U.S. Supreme Court denied a petition review to that October 14, 1980. Now, now after the failed, failed strike, though, at that point, you know, again, we still have a lot of time between uh, April of 1979 and uh, in October of 1980. The NASL now felt emboldened and began, began making some changes to working conditions. The problem is, as I said earlier, you're supposed to maintain the status quo. So the union starts filing a new set of unfair labor practice charges to the league's decision to do a bunch of things, reduce roster size, plan indoor soccer for 1979-80, increase the schedule. Uh, the NRB is agreeing with all that and is issuing a complaint and also took the extraordinary step of seeking injunctive relief, requiring a restoration of the status quo and voiding player contracts that had been signed and things like that. Uh, the injunction was granted August 18 of 1980 the NASL appealed that, and that appeal was denied October 6, 1980. And with the Supreme Court's denial of the representation case, the election appeal eight days later, the NASL knew it was finally beaten. So here we go. Having fought the uh, North American Soccer League Players Union for about three years, the league did the unexpected and basically rolled over at the bargaining table. After only uh, four all-night sessions, the parties reached agreement December 5, 1980, and the agreement was probably richer than the NASL could afford at the time and included a 25% increase in minimum salaries, 10% 10, 10 relocation bonus if you were traded or waived, um, guaranteed contracts. And interestingly, in lieu of immediate free agency, a two-year option clause that provided a, 17, a guaranteed 17% wage increase. And make no mistake, the, the, the union was out for blood. Indeed, Tony Chersky had this great quote saying, look, they could have had their sweetheart deal if they recognized us at the beginning. They fought us. They lost. Um, you know, here's the, you know, Garvey was a little more politic, saying, hey, it's a great agreement. Sure. The aftermath. And this is what people are most interested in. Well, first, let's talk about the immediate aftermath. Uh, while they may have reached agreement on the collective bargaining agreement, there was some bad blood along the way. Uh, after the 1979 season, a number of player representatives and strikers found themselves traded or cut, including some interesting examples. For instance, uh, future U.S. Hall of Famer uh, and California surf player rep Al Trost was traded to future Canadian Hall of Famer and Seattle player rep Tony Chersky after the 79 season. Future Hall of Famer and Cosmos player rep Bobby Smith 
was traded to San Diego during the 79 season. And someone who should be in the Hall of Fame, Chet Messing, who honored the line and did not play when Rochester went on strike, um, never played in the North American Soccer League again after the 79 season, despite starring in the, in the indoor league into the early 1980s. Um, and of course, lost in the news of the, of the contract being signed was other news. And the first week of December 1980, three teams, Rochester, Washington, and Houston, folded. The first franchise losses in the NASL since 1976. The league was not healthy. And now the lack of flexibility that the CBA uh, uh, provided did not help. The league folded after the 84 season, as we all know. Ironically, though, that was the first year of a successor collective bargaining agreement with the union one which contained a salary cap. Again, something that's illegal outside the confines of a CBA. So the league actually helped, the union actually helped the league exist one more year, but as we now know, too little too late. So here's the summer. Uh, people often ask, you know, well, who's to blame? The league, my point, my, my view is the union didn't kill the NASL. And frankly, the strike of 79 was barely an itch to be scratched. However, the union's presence, and more to the point, the league's decision to battle the union for as long as it did, certainly handicapped the league as far as shoring up fissures that began to be exposed in its base after the great expansion of 78. Um, it, but I, and I want to point this out, though. The league wasn't totally crazy. While the legal arguments it offered were, frankly, I say this as a labor attorney, kind of frivolous, the, the league had greater concerns. It must be recalled that the league was also in the process of suing the NFL because the NFL had passed a rule prohibiting NFL owners from owning any other teams, which was seen as a direct shot at the NASL, which was largely being bankrolled by Lamar Hunt and to a lesser extent, the Robbie family in Fort Lauderdale. So the, NFL, the league could be excused for thinking that the players union, backed as it was by the NFL players union, was a mole. So, you know, but unfortunately, while, while ostensibly fighting against the NFL, all the NASL did was manage to shoot itself. Again, let's talk about these, the status quo with working conditions again. Because of that, the NASL was unable to consider cost-saving moves post-78, um, such as uh, you know, perhaps reducing roster sizes, cutting salaries. The most fatal blow may very well be that because of that status quo issue, the NASL decided against staging an indoor season to compete against the new major indoor soccer league in 78-79. The league probably thought it wasn't worth the inevitable litigation. And indeed, they weren't wrong. When they tried it in 79, 80, there was litigation. The end result was the MISL had the winner of 78, 79 all to themselves, establishing a foothold, but more important, allowing it to become the NASL's primary rival going forward. It's interesting to note that given the MISL's raging, albeit short-lived success um, in its first 10 years, it, in stark contrast to NASL, had a great relationship with its union embraced unionization, and had a solid working relationship with the MISLPA, which was led by none other than John Kerr. Ultimately, the failures of the NASL in addressing the union issue was a microcosm of those that ultimately doomed the league, short-sighted ownership and battles between native players and imports. Um, for those interested in a deeper presentation, because I know I blew through this because of, uh, I didn't want to take up all the time, uh, Tim Hanlon, who's on the call, uh, hosted a, a wonderful discussion the link is there as part of his Good Seat Still Available podcast. Um, it is John Kerr's son, Bo. Uh, I don't know if he knows much about it. Well, I don't know if he was that involved with the MASLPA, to tell you the truth. Citations, obviously, uh, Soccer American local newspaper articles. And I thank you for your time. How long was that, Tom? Oh, I didn't have the clock. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah.